Welcome Mike Mitscher as he comes to share today. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. <laughs> Open your Bibles to uh, Acts chapter 10, and, and uh, we're going to play off the, tr tr the it's trick or treat. Y'all are having a trunk or treat uh, tonight, and I encourage you to go to that and, and participate. And, and uh, we're going to talk about the, the, the treat part of the trick or treat thing. We're going to talk about the, the per a person searching for the greatest treat ever. And then it's, it's our privilege to make the choice to look at them and say, hey, look, I'm going to share with you the greatest treat ever. And then uh, help people, you know, we're going to see how Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, actually his whole family, receives that greatest treat. I was uh, studying for this message today. I actually watched a TED talk about uh, what uh, to do when, when you've plateaued or, or professionally when you've stopped developing there's a, a TED talk from about 2016 by a guy whose name I can't pronounce, an Indian surgeon. The title of the TED talk is What to Do uh, If You Want to Do Something Great. How, how, do you, how do you get past just being good at your job and becoming an expert at your job? And doctors and, and everybody else uh, eventually plateau and kind of just uh, settle into what their norm is. And, and, and they can actually stop developing professionally. They call it arrested development in the professional realm. And I believe as a Christian, we can have arrested development. One of the songs we sang talked about how death was arrested when we received Christ as Savior. And I get that. That's a good arrestment, right? That's a good thing. But then as we uh, walk and, and, and serve the Lord, there's times where we can kind of plateau. And we're going to look at Peter and not just Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, and how I think Peter kind of had some arrested development. So what you talking about, Mike? Well, let's just get into the text. I'm going to read Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 8. We're going to try to read through this whole chapter. Uh, and and uh, Matt said that y'all were great listeners, that you listened fast. Was he right? Do y'all listen fast or slow? Can I go fast? Okay. So in your Bibles in Acts chapter 10, I'm going to read verses 1 through 8. We're going to try to read again the whole chapter. But we see Cornelius is searching for this greatest treat ever. He didn't know it, but he has this vision. And, and it goes like this. There was, in Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household. He gave generously to the people, and he prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, about three o'clock in the afternoon, he saw a vision of an angel come in, and, and, uh, and, and he was like, man, what is going on? About the ninth hour, he saw this. He, he, he clearly saw a vision of an angel from God, and he said, the angel said, hey, Cornelius, and um, Cornelius stared at him in terror. I don't know what you would do when an angel said your name, but uh, he was like, Phew. and this is a bad dude. I mean, this is a, 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 a man's man, a, a, a centurion, a ruler of strong men. And he was terrified by this moment. And he said, what is it, Lord? And he said, uh, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Everybody just say, wow. This guy's not saved. But the Bible says his prayers and his alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now, because of that, send men to Joppa and, and, and bring one Simon, who is called Peter. Go get this guy. He's got a message to deliver to you. He's lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. And when the angel who spoke to Cornelius had departed, uh, Cornelius called two of his servants and, and a third guy, a devout soldier, an, another devout guy, and, and from among those who attended to him. And having uh, related all these things to them, he sent these three on their way to Joppa. So I just want to pause because I know you guys are biblicists, so you want context. Cornelius is a centurion. A centurion's over a hundred soldiers. He was part of an Italian cohort. A cohort was about 600 soldiers. So this is a guy that knows authority, that he's, he's been in the system for a long time, but yet he lives differently than the average Roman. He lived in this place called Caesarea, 65 miles northwest of Jerusalem. Take your Bible, if you have your, like if you have a real Bible and not the fake like electronic ones, but uh, that was a joke. Take your Bible map, Look in the back, 
and find Jerusalem, go up and over to the left a little bit, and you'll see this town called Caesarea. Most Bible maps of the, uh, of the, the times of Jesus have Caesarea on there. Caesarea was this new, magnificent uh, city that had been built just before Jesus showed up. It was built by Herod the Great sometime between like 25 B.C. and 13 B.C. So it was a brand new seaport town, but it was a Gentile city and Jews would not go, they wouldn't step foot in the city if they could help it because of their preconceived notions about what God thought about all Gentiles. The city was named after Augustus Caesar and, and it was the Roman capital of Palestine. It was the center of all the military, uh, the government actions, all those things. And again, strict Jews would not step foot into town if they could keep from it. But Philip was from there, Philip the evangelist. In Acts 21, we figure out he was from there. Paul escaped to Caesarea. He, he uh, was imprisoned there, and he actually appealed to Caesar from Caesarea. So it's a major uh, spot in the New Testament gospel narrative. Then he has to send somebody to Joppa. Joppa is about 30 miles south. If you looked at the map, you can look down, and, and, and along the coast, you see the city of Joppa. About a two-day trip. Uh, again, Caesarea, they left this entourage of three guys left about 3 p.m. in the afternoon, and they arrive two days later at noon, so a little less than 48 hours later. It's about a two-day trip for these guys to go. And Cornelius, the Bible says in this passage, is a devout man. The word devout would be, we would say he was a righteous dude. Uh, he feared God, and all his household did. So, we all have influence. The, one, I think one of the greatest things that you have to steward is your influence. I, I know finances are important to steward. I, I know that your, your ministries are important to steward. But God gives you influence in your circles that you live life in. And I think that's the greatest thing you steward. How am, am I living in such a way that people allow me to influence them positively? Or am I living in such a way that my influence is negative? You're influencing people all the time. It's a question of whether it's good influence or bad influence. And Cornelius lived such a life. He had such character that the guys around him were like, hey, man, I want what he has. And, and, and so many of his uh, uh, guys that he worked, uh, that worked under him, like they were devout dudes too. And, and, and his family feared God. I don't think you can say much better about a person than to say he fears God. He gave generously to poor people, to, to the needs of the community around him. He gave generously, and he prayed continually. He was a man of prayer. He worshiped the one true God, but again, he was lost. Later on in the passage, it says he was well thought of by all the Jewish people. Look, that's a great description of a Lebanon Baptist church, church member, isn't it? Uh, a devout, God-fearing, giving, praying, worshiping, well-spoken of, influential uh, person in a community. So Cornelius, uh, having, having being all these things, when God spoke to him, he was ready to be instantly obedient. How many of you are ready to be instantly obedient to whatever the Lord tells you? Don't raise your hand. That's scary. That's scary. I know a, not a lot of them raised their hand. Let me ask that again. How many of you are willing to be instantly obedient to the Holy Spirit if he tells you to do something? Come on now. Uh, yeah, a few. The rest of you are being honest. Like, I'm not going to trick you into raising your hand and then committing to something, okay? I'm not doing that. I'm just saying, Cornelius, when told to do something, said, yes, sir. He did it instantly. He was instantly obedient. And if you're a parent, delayed obedience is disobedience. Say that with me. Delayed obedience is disobedience. And, and, and so Cornelius didn't delay. He was instantly obedient. And, and, and the lesson that we learned from Cornelius, and we're going to look at Peter too, but from Cornelius we learned that, that when people seek God, it moves God to action. And, you know, I, I, I believe in total depravity, and I believe, you know, lost people are dead spiritually, in, unable to, to do anything positive towards a right relationship with God. But the Bible does seem to teach that this guy is lost. He, he clearly is lost. But yet he's going through the things that require a guy to have a, a healthy relationship and, and be res, uh, respected, if you'll use that word, from God. God looked down and said, there's a guy that I can use. There's a guy. And I believe God is drawing all people to himself. Like the, Jesus said, if I'm lifted up, 
I will draw all people to myself. And I believe he was lifted up, and I believe he's drawing everybody. Everybody you encountered this week, everybody you encountered last week, God is drawing in some way uh, uh, to, to himself. I, the, there's statistics that say about every six months, people go through a life-changing event that causes them to slow down and think about life beyond themselves, like a birth of a loved one, the death of a loved one, a marriage a move, a career change, all these kind of things throughout life. God, and God uses those things to kind of cause people to slow down and think. And we don't know. Peter had no idea what was going on uh, uh, up, up shore in, in Cornelius. I had no idea. Peter had no idea that this guy was like seeking to know more about God. But it moved God to action and, and he obeyed and he sent for Peter. And we're going to hear, by the way, from the other side now, what's going on in Peter's life. So now I'm going to read verses nine and following. Okay. So Peter has this choice to either treat or mistreat Cornelius. And before he's given the choice, God has to teach him a lesson. And in Acts 10 verses nine and following, it says this. Now the next day, they, as those guys were on the journey and approaching the city, Peter went out on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. So this is about noon. By the way, devout Jews were told to pray in the morning and the evening. But the upper echelon of Jews like King David and Daniel and those guys, they prayed at noontime too. So you're required to pray twice, but really, really in tight with the Lord guys, prayed three times a day. Peter's doing that. Still 10, 10 years into his walk with the body of Christ, he's, he's practicing these things, these traditions that carried over from the culture he grew up in. And he became hungry. It was about lunchtime, so he was supposed to be hungry. And he wanted something to eat. But while they, were, he, 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 uh, while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance. Verse 11 says, He saw the heavens open and something like a great sheet descending, being let down from the four corners on the earth. If I was, he, if I was like the, the pastor of this church, I would have rigged this up this week. But I'm not the pastor of this church. But I would have rigged up like a sheet coming down from uh, up here while I was speaking it and it would just spill out with this stuff and y'all be like wow because visuals are powerful stuff and that's why God is using a visual illustration to teach Peter a very real heart lesson Peter saw the heavens open and something like a great sheet descending being let down from the four corners of the earth in it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air and there came a voice to him rise Peter kill and eat Peter said uh uh by no means. Everybody say, by no means. That's y'all that wouldn't raise your hand to say you'd be instantly obedient. Uh -uh. God is telling Peter something. And he says, by no means, Lord. For I, I, sh I shouldn't have said, I wasn't going to trick you because I just tricked you. I, I'm not tricking you. We, we don't want to disobey the Lord, but there are times with the best of motives, we do exactly contrary to what God has called us to do. And that's what's going on in Peter's. Peter's got a great motive. This is the third time he has told God no. You know, Jesus said, I got to go die. He said, uh uh, not on my watch. And Jesus said, Get behind me, Satan. Right? Then Jesus wanted to wash Peter's feet, and he said, uh uh, you're not going to wash my feet. He said, okay, then you want no part of it. Okay, then wash my whole body. And, and so here's the third time that Peter is told something directly by God, and, and he says, no. I don't know about you, but there's times I do that. There's times I'm told something directly by God, and I'm like, no, that doesn't make sense. That contradicts who I am. I think this should be the plan, not that. Again, the best of motives, but he was, and he was convinced he was right. How many of you think Peter thought he was right each of those three times? He's right. I can't eat that stuff. I've never touched that stuff to eat. I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. The voice came to him again a second time and again. Peter seldom gets things the first time. How many of you are grateful for that? <laughs> for Peter's example, because I seldom get things the first time. I seldom get things the first time. Matter of fact, there's times I'm unconscious because God has to finally take a two by four and go kabam! And hit me across the forehead. Because he's been trying to teach me subtly. He's been trying to teach me like, hey! And I won't listen. So sometimes he just goes, boom! And knocks me in the head. I'm grateful that God continues to pursue me. To grow me. And he says this. What I've called clean 
do not call common. This is the message from God to Peter. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once. Now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision might mean, behold, the men who had been sent by Cornelius having inquired of where Simon's house that stood at the gate. So this is, God is sovereignly timing all this stuff so that Cornelius sends the people, and, and this Peter is seeing this just as they're at the door to show up. I, I bet Peter's chuckling by this point. And um, they called out as to whether Simon called Peter was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, like while he was thinking, what in the world does this mean? The Spirit said to him, Behold, there's three men that are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation. Now, this doesn't mean without hesitation doesn't mean like do it right now. But it means do it with no reservations. Whatever they say, do without reservation. Why did he have to be told that? Because as a Jew, he would be reserved. He would hesitate to go with Gentiles anywhere. And much less eat with them and, and go into a house with them as he eventually does. He says, rise and go down without hesitation because I have sent them. God says, they're from me. And Peter went down and he saw the man. He said, I'm the one you're looking for. What's the reason for your visit? You think he knew? You think he knew? I don't think he knew that there was like someone, a whole household fixing to get saved. I don't think he knew that. But I think he knew it had something to do with what just happened on the rooftop. He says, what's the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, well spoken of among the whole Jewish nation, has directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what uh, you have to say. And so he invited him in to be his guest. Peter invited him in. Now, Matt, wouldn't you like for someone to say, hey, look, we know you're a messenger of God. We've assembled this whole group. Could you come speak? Because they are chomping at the bit to hear what you have to say. That's every preacher's dream, right? And, and so Peter invites them in. And, and, and they're his guest, again, he's learning this vision. He would not have invited them in and, and probably ate with them. Uh, it doesn't say, but they had just fixed him some food. The next day he rose and went with them. And some of the brothers from Joppa accompanying him, he took six other people. It, three witnesses re, were required to report in, in, the, in that culture, in the Jewish culture, something that happened. He took six people with him because he says, something's up. Something's about to go down major. And so I'm going to have double the amount of witnesses go with me so that when we have to report this back, we get the story like we, we verify it, we validate it. And so, again, six people go with him. And, and, and um, he, he gets to the, the house. Cornelius was expecting them. And, and he had called together his relatives and his close friends. And this is what I want to talk to you about real quickly, okay? This is, we're going to slow down here and just talk about Cornelius. I know we're looking at Peter right now. But this, again, is Cornelius stewarding his influence. And, and, and Cornelius was expecting them to get back. And he gathered he had friend day at his house. He got all his friends and all his relatives, anybody that could come, anybody that would come. He said, hey, we got to hear from God. You know, there's this, like, there's this saying in, in American culture that you don't talk about politics or religion. That's a lie from hell. God wants you to steward your influence to gather people together and share the gospel with them. He wants you to steward that influence. And, and Cornelius was doing that. And, and they were chomping at the bit to hear what this man had to say. And, and Cornelius fell down. When Peter walked in, uh, in verse 25, Cornelius met him and fell down and, and worshiped him. And, you know, most preachers would have said, <laughs> yeah, look, he knows I'm the man. But Peter, not so. Peter says, hey, boy, not boy. He said, hey, man, get up because I too am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered, and he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate or visit with anyone of another nation. Peter's telling this group of people how he was in their presence, because otherwise he wouldn't have come in. He, he would not have come in had that vision not just occurred on his rooftop a few days earlier. He would not have done it because, he says, y'all guys know, you, you live in this city, you, you interact with Jews, you know it's not kosher for a Jew to come in and fellowship with a bunch of Gentile people. He says, you, you know, we, we're not supposed to do this but God. Everybody say, but God. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common 
are unclean. In the whole gospel narrative, Acts chapter 10 is a game changer. In Genesis chapter 1, it says, let us make man in our image. I believe all mankind are God's image bearers. Whether they're a follower of God or not, they're image bearers. When, when Noah came out of the ark and God instituted human government and, and established the death penalty, the justification in Genesis chapter 9 for the death penalty for anybody was because all men are God's image bearers. In Genesis 9, 6, all men, whether they're saved or not, bear God's image. And so God says all human life is valuable enough to protect with that because they're my image bearer. And what happens is we like same and don't like other. I've been around the world in Africa, in Nepal, in India, in China, in Cuba, in America. Uh, I've been all over the place. People like to hate other. They like same and they hate other. It's different. I don't quite understand it. So I'm just going to find some reason to not have to interact with people who are other than me. And that's what the Jews were doing. In, embedded in the Jewish culture, embedded in the homes a Jewish child grew up in, was a, was a prejudice towards Gentiles. Because they were different religiously. They were different uh, all kinds of ways. And there was this embedded hatred. And this is a pivotal moment in the gospel because God desires not just one group of people to get saved, but who does God desire to get saved? All people, everybody. And, and, and again, everybody, even the people who are different, a different color, a different look, different abilities, different nationalities, different heritage, different beliefs, different behavior, different positions, in society, different social status, different wealth. God desires all of them to be saved. But prejudice flows out of pride. Like my pride kind of says, hey, I'm it. I'm together. And everybody that's not like me doesn't have it together and is not it. And again, prejudice flows right out of pride. My, my old nature and, and my ego and pride love to be judgmental and prejudiced towards people. But when I got saved, I had to make a decision to arrest that, to stop that. I had to make a choice to say, I'm not going to do that. And, and anytime I sense it in me, I'm going to put it down. Because that person I'm talking to or I'm feeling that way towards is an image bearer of my creator. And somebody that Jesus loves and died for and wants to hear the gospel. Again, the word prejudice is unfavorable opinion, feeling formed beforehand or, uh, and without knowledge, thought, or, or, or reasoning. Some types of prejudice include ignoring, neglecting, joking, using them as the butt of the joke, gossiping, cursing, passing over, segregating, abusing, fighting against, opposing, persecuting, enslaving. Again, there's all kinds of ways that we can be prejudiced towards people, even without knowing it. And Peter did not know it. You know how long the gospel, the church, Acts chapter 2 to Acts chapter 10, you know how long it was? According to Warren Wisby and commentary, it's about 10 years. Everybody go, wow. So Peter preached in, in Acts chapter 2, and the church was born 10 years before this. So for the next 10 years, Peter had not shared the gospel with a Gentile. That's dumbfounding to me. Like, how could that be? Peter was either aware of his prejudice towards Gentiles and defended it biblically. Well, they're dead dogs. Hell was made like that. And we're supposed to separate from them. And we're standing against unrighteousness. And so he either was aware that he was prejudiced towards them and justified it biblically. Or he was unaware. I don't know which it was. I really don't know which it was. But either way, Peter makes a choice. Whether he was aware of it or completely unaware of it. With this vision on the rooftop. And God says, don't you dare call anything that I've called clean, or, or, uh, 
unclean. Don't you dare call anything that, that I value as invaluable, unvaluable, right? Unvaluable. And Peter makes a choice right now in Acts chapter 10 to, to replace prejudice with the sanctity of life. Every human life. Did you know in Jewish culture it was okay if you saw a Gentile woman giving birth on the side of the road? It was acceptable to not stop and help her? Because who wants another Gentile in the world? I mean, that's how, that, that's how bad they thought about Gentiles. By the way, if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. Raise your hand if you're not a Jew. Okay, so Peter hated you just because you're a Gentile. And if your wife was giving birth on the side of the road, Peter wouldn't have stopped and helped. Is that the sanctity of life? No. The sanctity of life is not just when we say, I, I value the life of my people, but it's when I value the life of all people, from the womb to the tomb. Not just when they're unborn, but after they're born. And, and when I interact with them all day, every day, God values every human life I encounter. And God wants me to give the greatest treat ever to every person I can. So lessons from Peter. What do we learn from Peter? That Peter was 10 years into his walk as an apostle in the church. He was 10 years into it, but he had reached some kind of arrested development, I believe. I, I believe he had he'd encountered some kind of like plateau. And, and God said, okay, it's time for me to take him to the next level. I don't know why God waited 10 years. I don't know. I'll ask him when I get there. But he dealt with Peter's stagnation or, or whatever was hindering him from growing. I ask you that because how long have you been saved? Most of you here, I would say, are saved. How long have you been saved? How much have you grown lately? Have you reached some kind of status quo in your walk with the Lord where you're kind of like, oh, I'm good. I'm, I'm teaching Sunday school. I'm having daily devotions. You know, I'm uh, Shekinah glory juice drips off me as I walk into church. <laughs> or, you, you know, we can get that pride kind of like, no, 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 no. A, a real, genuine, humble Christian is a lifelong grower. They say, I've never arrived, and I need to grow in intimacy and in my relationship with the Lord. And Peter chose, because of his growth step, to treat Cornelius as an equal and share with him the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he went in and said, Cornelius, Jesus loves you, and Jesus died on the cross for your sins. And he rose again three days later. And I'm summarizing the message that Peter uh, shared with him later in the chapter. And, and as Peter was explaining the gospel to Cornelius and all his household, they got saved. Like just on the spot, they believed. It wasn't at the end of the message when Peter gave an altar call. It was while he was saying, Jesus took the punishment that you deserve for your sins. And Cornelius, yes, you're a God-fearing man. You're well thought of, but you're lost. And if you die, you'll go to hell. If your family dies, they'll go to hell. And they need Jesus because there's one mediator. There's one Savior. And you must come on this side of the cross. And if you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, do that right now and just say, God, I believe that Jesus died for me, that he took the punishment that I deserve, and that he rose again three days later, and that he's offering to me the free gift of eternal life, a forgiveness of sins, and a, able to, the songs we sang, I want to stand in heaven, singing the hymn of heaven one day, because of what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross. I would say the vast majority of you have already been saved, already been born again, but if you've not, do so right now. You just did. Believe in your heart. The rest of you, make sure you're not arrested in your development towards Christ-likeness. Make sure you don't have pride and ego and prejudice in your heart towards anybody because in America right now, it's very easy to kind of live in a prejudice kind of framework and not even realize it. I grew up in the mountains of Virginia 
2% other. I grew up in a county full of people that literally was 98% what I am. And God taught me to say, Mike, there's nothing special about you. You're just a guy. And, and, and I love this guy and that guy and that guy and that guy. And Mike, I want to use you to go share my love with all these people. Are you willing? And my wife and I both, six weeks into being a Christian, said, we're willing to go wherever you want, whenever you want, just because you want. Would you do that? Let's stand. And they'll sing a song. And as they sing a song, I just invite you to do something as they're coming. I want to invite you to do something, okay? I want you to adopt five homes in your community. I, I want you to adopt five homes that you know are not Christian. Five Corneliuses. Okay? I want you to adopt them, and I want you to start praying for them. Maybe they're your geographical neighbor. Maybe they're somebody you encounter as you go to work each day, and they're not geographically close. But I want you to begin to pray for five homes in this area that you know, that you have some kind of relationship with, or that you can have some kind of relationship with, and begin to pray for them. To be saved. Five homes that you know are not Christian. And begin to pray for them. Wouldn't it be great if God made it hard to go to hell? From Lebanon Baptist Church's area of responsibility. Because you're doing such a great job at loving people. And fulfilling the great commandment and the great commission. You're doing such a great job at loving people. That it's actually hard to go to hell from here. Because the gospel is so saturated this area. Wouldn't that be great? How many of you think that's great? So as we leave here, make sure you're saved. Make sure you've not stagnated in your growth. But would you please adopt five homes? Write them down and begin praying for them.